Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Halter, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. I'm actually here at my point of sale with Bio Dude Houston. You can come visit me Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, and Saturday, 10 to 2. And with me, I have a very special guest. His name is Chase Jennings, the owner of Houston Frogs, and I'm really excited to host him on my channel. Chase, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, I own Houston Frogs. Um, I also own uh, Texas Mycology Supply, and uh, I'm part owner of Amphibious Labs. Uh, my specialty is amphibians. Um, I breed dart frogs, uh, also grow exotic plants. We also work with a lot of uh, fungal culturing as well for gourmet mushrooms and mushrooms for vivarium use. Um, we have a lot of different cool projects going on. It's really exciting because behind me, I have an 18 by 18 by 24 exoterra frog and co enclosure, which they specifically market for dart frogs. Guess what we're building today? <laughs> I got a beautiful pair that Chase uh, pro provided to us of Dendrobates leucamellus. Now, Chase, tell, tell us briefly a little bit about these guys. So these are fine spot leucamellus. Uh, as you know, we have the standard leucamellus, which are going to have the bands uh, and the spots. These are going to have very fine spotting on them, which honestly are some of my favorites just because of really cool patterns that you see. That female is an absolute unit with a capital U. I mean, she guys, is. she's wider than my thumb. <laughs> like, look at that. Amazing. Yeah. We like to keep them chunky. Yep. So. <laughs> I'm really excited to do this. We got a plethora of stuff here. I got some of Chase's products. I got some of my products so we can make a bad ass build. Let's get building. Let's do it. Okay. So obviously, since it's a really high, uh, high hue humidity biome, we're going to start with the drainage layer. So with the drainage layer, we're going to be using the HydroGrow version two, which I'm, you know, this is. We also offer the the smaller clay-based HydroGrow, which works. But since there's going to be so much water passing through uh, with this drain, I elected to go with the other version of HydroGrow. Also, will allow us to keep an eye on our on our water level slightly easier than version one. So I'm going to go ahead and start getting this added in here. Uh, Chase, cool. so why is the drainage layer so important when it comes to these tropical settings? Well, as you know, in the rainforest, we're going to have water that's going to be percolating through the soil, and is slowly going to be draining into. Um, uh, below the soil. In these vivariums, if we don't have that drainage layer, then fortunately that water will just sit in the substrate, which can then waterlog the substrate yep. uh, and then create bacterial issues because yep. bacteria loves it to, uh, loves to grow in waterlogged areas, especially areas yep. that are anaerobic without having oxygen there because it's just saturated with water. And, and that's really important why the right substrate is used, mm -hmm. in which I guess we'll get into that in a second. So I do have a screen barrier here. So I am putting in the screen barrier here into the bottom. Now, if you're using my HydroGrow version one, if you are not using having this with burrowing animals, then the screen is not needed. Um, but you can use it if you you know want to. Uh, but I since the HydroGrow version two creates more of a bumpy top, it's really important you put a barrier in here to prevent your substrate from mixing in with your actual drainage layer. So next, we're gonna go ahead and add in some of my terraflora. So my terraflora isn't the only thing that you can use for dart frogs. There's a lot of great options out there, but Chase, tell me, or I guess tell my viewers, why is it important to have a substrate that retains humidity, but just passes water through it like a strainer when you're keeping dart frogs? Well, it's extremely important to have substrate that's going to be well draining, something that's not only going to support plant life, something that's going to support the beneficial bacteria and fungi, but also something that's not going to become waterlogged. Um, in the past, people have used uh, cocoa fiber and things like that, and unfortunately it's very hydroscopic. It just absolutely gets saturated with water. Again, it holds onto the water. And since it has such a high pH, which it's typically about a 6 to a 6.0 on the pH scale, which is almost neutral, it makes it ideal for bacterial growth. Now, uh, what Josh is using and uh, what typically people use in the, the dart frog community, ABG, ABG-like substrates, um, these are going to have more of an acidic pH because true rainforest soils could be around a 5 to a 5.5 on the pH scale, which is which going to be more acidic. Which comes from the sphagnum moss, which is yep. a, one of the primary ingredients in the terraflora. Sphagnum moss, sphagnum peat. Yep. And that's going to maintain the proper acidity in the soil that's going to prevent harmful bacteria from being able to take hold in there. 
what I did was I put some of my Terraflora in a bag, added some water, got my water consistency the way I want it. I'm just gonna keep dumping. So the milled sphagnum peat is uh, one of the primary ingredients in your, you know, in my Terraflora. So one thing you notice with my Terraflora is that it is not very, it's not as chunky as comparison to some of your other brands because it's more of a dirt based mix. It still functions the same of allowing water to pass through it the way that it's supposed to, but it also allows, you know, that it doesn't break down near as fast. So it doesn't feel like an orchid substrate. And that's kind of, mm -hmm. when I did that, I did that for ease of use. Um, but Chase, when it comes to, you know, like a lot of our dart frog keepers that, that want to use ABG, mm -hmm. how long can they expect their ABG to last before it kind of needs a little bit of a top off? If it will mm -hmm. need a top off at all. Well, typically the leaf litter is going to re be replaced about every year, but the substrate itself should stay good for about four to five years. Good. Uh, it takes that long for the substrate to start to break down and then for the nutrients to be able to be utilized by the plants and the bacteria and the fungi in there. Uh, at that point, when it gets about to the four or five mark, that's when the substrate should be replaced and replenished. Yep, and you know, that's something that you as a keeper just, ha just have to pay attention to, but your plant, mm -hmm. your plant roots and the beneficial fungal and bacterial process that you have established in your tank play a huge role with your longevity. Huge they really role. do. And the beautiful okay. thing about the substrate that layer that you're using as well is it almost acts like a hydroponic layer. So your plant roots aren't just going to be growing in the substrate itself, but they're actually going to be growing through that substrate, through the barrier, into that uh, hydroponic material down there. And the beautiful thing about that is uh, a lot of times people say that, well, they think that this is too shallow a place for planting. But when you count this, the uh, drainage layer itself, then you actually have a lot more room for roots than what you would originally think you would. Okay. So, so, Chase, I got about a three inch layer of terra flora in here. So just, so just so we know, guys, mm -hmm. this is what we're rocking and rolling with. We have a two and a half inch layer of drainage layer, and actually about two inches. Two inch layer mm -hmm. of drainage layer and about two to two and a half inches of substrate. I can deal with that. I think that's gonna give us a nice depth level with the plants that we're using, but the substrate's not gonna take up a bunch of space. We are planning on having it be multi-tiered. So what comes next, you guys know, is we add biodegradables. So we do have some, some sphagnum moss in here. I actually have some in a bucket and that's what I'm gonna use. Now, when you're keeping dart frogs and when you're establishing your tank there with the sphagnum moss, there's something that's really important that, that you wanna make sure that you don't do. And Chase, tell us tell us a, a, a little bit about that. So as a Kaya mix sphagnum moss into the substrate layer itself, actually ABG does call for milled sphagnum. <clears throat> and what that's gonna do is while the vivarium is establishing, while all those materials are hydrating and your humidity is stabilizing, the moisture content of the soil is stabilizing, the sphagnum moss is very hydroscopic. It also has uh, very good acidity to it. It's going to be around, again, a five on the pH scale. And the nice thing is that helps to aerate the substrate when you're first starting out. And it's also going to provide that moisture the plants need. Now that substrate, as long as it's containing the sphagnum moss and the sphagnum moss is not packed on top of the substrate, you're perfectly good. This, the sphagnum moss is going to start to break down, it's going to biodegrade, the plants are going to utilize it for nutrients. Um, one mistake that a lot of people do is they put a really thick layer of sphagnum moss on top of the substrate. You don't want to do that and that's because it actually helps to waterlog the top layer of the substrate. It's going to make your leaves break down a lot faster. It's going to keep the top portion of your substrate very wet. And that can also cause bacterial issues, uh, especially in uh, more sensitive species like Phyllobates, for instance. Phyllobates terribilis, um, a lot of times they'll have uh, foot bacterial issues, infections, which will look like blisters. And that's from keeping the top layer too wet. Uh, yeah. So when we're building these vivariums, we want to make sure that the leaf layer is actually drying out in between misting. We don't want it to stay wet. And it's perfect for your humidity to stay around 80, 90 percent. We just want to make sure that the leaves are drying out in between misting. Yep. So as you can see, I left the spag on top. I'm doing exactly what Chase told me not to do. But that's okay, because what I'm going to do next is add in some leaf litter. Mm -hmm. I add some nice uh, magnolia leaves right here. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is add in uh, some fungal cultures, and then we're going to mix everything together. So that way, it's going to aerate effectively from top mm -hmm. to bottom, promote positive bacterial growth while putting uh, nutrients uh, back into our plants and for our soil enrichment. So the first thing I'm going to add is my bio shot. So everyone, everyone know, knows what this is. It's, it has your, your natural organic grade, animal grade fertilizer in it. But the most importantly, 
It has the ar the archaea bacteria as well as two different types mm -hmm. of mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. Now, Chase, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the difference between endo and ecto, and how mm -hmm. it works in the tank itself with the Bioshock. So, as you know, most plants on the planet, I'm talking about 95% of plants, have symbiotic relationships with these fungi, which we call mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, these mycorrhizal fungi are typically uh, classified in two different groups. That's endomycorrhizal, actually work within the root structure themselves, and then ectomycorrhizal fungi, which actually create a sheath around roots. Now, these actually make the plants more resistant to disease. They're also going to create uh, these little hyphae that are going to go out and collect micronutrients for the plants, so the plants aren't going to be able to collect themselves because these uh, fungal structures actually uh, collect way more surface area than what those roots can. Yep. So what that means is that those plants, in exchange for a little bit of sugars given to those fungi, those fungi help those plants grow more vigorously, be more resistant to disease, uh, to establish much faster, to have a much higher survival rate when you first put those plants in. Yep. And so as you can see, while well, he gave us that amazing, mm -hmm. amazing education lesson, I got it all mixed together. This is the consistency that you want. You want a little bit of leaves on top. You want to be able to have the spag exposed, but thoroughly mixed with your substrate, okay? Um, and then again, that's going to help with your air pockets. It's going to pro pro provide fuel for your tank. So you remember the biodegradables mm -hmm. is the fuel that drives the car and the car is the substrate. It's the easiest way that I can remember, that I can mm -hmm. talk about it. And we also have something I've never used before that is really exciting. And this is a, a great, another a great Houston Frog product. Chase, tell us about your little culture right here. So these are actually going to be uh, our slime mold cultures. Uh, now slime mold, it's something that typically in the past people would have as a little, you know, a joy when they would see it on the side of their glass climbing along. It's actually a protist. It's not actually a fungi. They feed upon uh, fungi and they feed upon bacteria. So not only is this something interesting to grow, but it's something that will actually help to clean your vivarium by eating uh, bacteria and fungi, keeping them in check because it is a predator. So I don't have to, now do I just take mm -hmm. this and dump this in or do I have to do something to this culture before I use yeah, it? Yeah, you can actually take the oats and then dump them right under the leaves if you want to. And those okay. oats have that protist on them and they're going to grow and then reach out and start feeding upon those microbes. Now, for those of you who don't know, a protist is? It is a single cell organism. So even though it is a large organism and it can be uh, subdivided into different organisms, it is technically a single cell organism. Now, you and I both know that the isopods are gonna try and eat these oats. Is it gonna make mm -hmm. our cleanup crew sick if there are bugs decide to eat this? No, actually the oats are um, high in carbohydrates. They're something that um, the isopods yep. are going to uh, be eating and it's not going to make them sick in the slightest. Good. And really it's just the carrying medium for the slime mold. Yeah, the you slime can actually mold, see some slime mold on this leaf. Right yep. The slime mold is just going to be traveling along the vivarium collecting microbes. Cool. All right guys. Mm -hmm. So we made some good progress here. We have our layer of drain. We have a drainage layer, screen divider, terra flora, or if you decide to not use flora, use like ABG or whatever mm -hmm. else, you know, you decide to use that functions in the way that we told you. And then our biodegradables thoroughly mixed in with our um, fungal and bacterial inoculants. The mm -hmm. only thing we need to add yet is springtails and isopods. Mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna actually do that right now. So we actually have some, uh, we have a couple, a lot of dwarf white isopods. <laughs> so as you can see in here, dwarf whites make an excellent, uh, excellent, cleanup crew for the poison dart frogs because they uh, are so good at staying deep in the soil and really mm -hmm. help aerate everything. So yeah, and they're also an excellent here. source of calcium and protein for the frogs as well. Yes, they are. So I want to find them in here. There we go. It's a whole little cluster of them. Okay, I'll dump those guys in too into the back. Okay. Next, we have springtails. Now, Chase, tell us a little bit about your clay culture of springtails here. So this is actually a clay formula that I came up with that's specifically formulated for springtail growth. Uh, it's particularly the medium that they're going to be foraging on, uh, particularly for the food that we feed them. It's also going to be the media which they're going to lay their eggs on as well. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few in here. Uh, these are temperate springtails, Bolsoma candida. And the really nice thing about these clay cultures is you can literally just turn them upside down, tap them, and all the springtails come out. Yep. So show us. If you want to go ahead and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, put in some of those, you guys sure. can catch how so, to, how do you put your clay cultured springtails into your biofilm. Just as easy as tapping, and you see all the springtails come out. Yep. 
And if you want, you can actually save this as a feeding culture and then uh, just keep feeding keep them, the, miss yep. them, and they're good to go. How often do you have to miss that culture, Chase? Uh, about once a week to okay. once every other week. Just keep the clay so hydrated. I have a really nice culture of tropical pinks here. These are big species. Big, big, big species. Frogs love them. Yep. You know, it's actually good to be able to put in different species springtails. When I've been out collecting springtails, I'll typically find three, four, five different species of springtails all cohabitating together and feeding upon different fungi because some are more specialized feeders and they'll uh, eat different fungi. So when you have different species, then you'll be able to control more types of fungi than if you just have one. So, Chase, this is the best mm -hmm. part. So, <laughs> I want to show you something that's been really neat. These are are little 3D printed bioluminescent mushrooms mm -hmm. that Chase has created that glow in the dark. They are attached to this piece of ghost wood via a hot glue gun, so it's completely harmless and non-toxic to your animals. Yep. And we're going to use this as a part of the center of a focal point in the tank. So we're going to, what do you think about putting this here? And then I also have Chase, what do you think oh, about? Yeah, what I can hold think? that for you. Yeah, I think okay. that looks good that there. That looks good there? Yeah. And we got some pumice stone that I'm going to put here. Cool. And I'm going to put here and let that rest like that. Perfect. Great. So this is just to kind of create a little bit of a, of a barrier. So mm -hmm. then what I want to do with this tank, since leucamellas are terrestrial, but they will also take advantage of height. They will. So we want to give them a lot of opportunities to be able to do that. So we have this beautiful piece right here. Look at that. That I've been saving for a very special type of build. That's a gnarly looking piece. I love that. I just want to try mm -hmm. something. Chase, <laughs> if you don't like it, tell me. No, I think that looks great. I mean, it looks like it fits perfectly into and place. Then we put the piece of ghost wood, I think and then we good. fill in right back here with some substrate to give it a nice even layer. Hmm. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that works. I like that a lot, and the substrate mm -hmm. is going to hold it up. Okay. Absolutely. So while we're adding up the substrate, Chase, what mm -hmm. is some of the best types of wood uh, for uh, people to use in dart frog enclosures? So like wood mm -hmm. like grapevine isn't that great because it's such mm -hmm. a lightweight, porous wood that it's going to mold so fast. Right. It's more um, prone to it, that. Yeah. And call, it could, you know, lead to the type of molds you don't want. Mm -hmm. So what are your favorite types of woods to use when uh, dealing with your dart frog habitat? Well, I like to use more dense uh, wood or even cork because cork is hydrophobic. It's actually going to help to repel the water. Uh, that's why cork lasts for so, so, so long because it doesn't allow the water to penetrate it. Um, or if you're using really dense woods like ghost wood or like Indonesian driftwood. Uh, those will last for years to come. Uh, typically, it's good to use uh, some type of hardwood or, again, cork. Um, something that's going to last. Um, if you use softwoods, it's okay, but you just have to count those uh, biodegrading in a very short amount of time, especially with the fungal cultures that are going to be colonizing the wood. Yep. And that's your key right there, are the different types of funguses that you have in there because you want them to all work together. Absolutely. It's one big symbolic community. Yeah. Okay. That looks that cool. looks amazing. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And that'll give them a nice place to hide and feel safe as well. Boom. Awesome. And I'm going to put a little bit of substrate back there in the corner so I can plant something that's going to go up. So as far as hardscape is concerned, I'm okay with it. And then we let's, let's revisit it at the end. What do you think about that? I think that's a good okay. idea. I'm going to get for now. a little bit more flora in here. So as far as temperature, humidity, tell us about their care. So uh, it depends on the species of dart frogs that you're keeping, yep. but uh, so, specifically for Luke Mellis, yes. uh, you never want the temperature to drop below 65, and okay. you never want it to get above 80. Now that's going to be the temperature of the vivarium itself. Typically the way that we control the vivarium temperature is through ambient room temperature. And due to the greenhouse effect, typically the vivarium is going to be a couple degrees higher. 
Um, so in other words, if it's about 70 degrees in your house, it should be around 72 or so in the vivarium itself. So it's average of three degree difference. Yeah, about two to three degrees difference. Okay. Um, that's going to depend on a lot of factors. It's also going to depend upon like how many plants you have in there. That's really going to affect the humidity as well. The more plants you have, the more the surface area you have transpiring during the day. Uh, that transpiration is actually going to give uh, evapotranspiration is that's going to give off a lot of humidity into the air. Um, now that humidity is going to typically be around uh, 80 to 90 percent for dart frogs. It's okay if it gets up higher than that. It's okay if it gets a little bit lower than that for a short period of time. One of the really important reasons to put that leaf layer in there as well is because it also helps with thermoregulation with uh, moisture regulation. So those frogs, if you there see them is. hiding, then that's going to tell you that either the temperature is too high, it's too cold, or there's not enough humidity, or there's, they're not really going to care if there's too much humidity, quite honestly. we got a lot of good options here for plants. Oh, we so do. So <laughs> Chase brought some beautiful, uh, some beautiful plants. So first, um, let's take a look at these. Okay. So right here, this is a beautiful uh, Selaginella. You can mm -hmm. see the extensive root base down here. I already know exactly where I'm going to be putting this. And then we have a beautiful Margravia stencinii. Um, now, these guys are, they're slow growers. They correct? are. And they mm -hmm. like to be, um, they like to grow on actual, like, things that are porous that they can sink their roots into that retain moisture. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like we have another Margravia right here. Is, what, mm -hmm. what is this? Uh, that's Margravia rectiflora. Rectiflora. Very mm -hmm. nice. Okay. So... We will get we will get there, and then we also got some beautiful mosses and stuff. So, the first thing I want to look at, Chase, is we got this area right here that we really want to fill in, but not mm -hmm. cover up entirely. So I'm thinking uh, we do have an alocasia mm -hmm. that I think would do really good. Just yeah, we'll probably want to put something taller growing for that corner, and that's a good um, that's a good option for that. Um, people often call that an African shield. Uh, the alocasias are a great option. Uh, this one's not going to get as big as some others are. It can get decently large, but it's not going to, you know, you can just watch it. And yeah, and you can always sure. trim it as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, guys, I'm trying to be as careful as I can here to not destroy these plant roots. Yeah, right on top of that cork. Yeah. Okay, so then we got this here. Now this will, I repeat, it will take over your enclosure if you let it. And of course, Chase, I'm going to let you do the final touches with this and you okay. can make and see if that's what you want. But then we have this back left corner. So for me, we're going to want something that's going to be bushy and have a lot of height. And I'm thinking this mm -hmm. bad boy right here. Yeah, the Calathea orbifolia. Yep, the Calathea orbifolia, you heard it. Put that right there in the back. Yeah. Okay. And we still have bromeliads. So mm -hmm. next we have, I'm going to get this section opened up. Obviously up here is going to be going to be br bromeliad central. Chase bought a mm -hmm. bunch of beautiful plant, uh, beautiful plants over here. Mm -hmm. So is this a, uh, or so what's going to be the best spot? Well, that's Rufa for a uh, dragon tail. Well, for the you Margravia, think? it's going to be somewhere that can grow up. I'm thinking um, the Margravia right here. I think that would be a good choice for that. Okay. You notice how it's already been propagated on this root. Now, uh, when I take this out, guys, I'm going to I'm not going to touch the root system, and I'm going to gently uh, take this off. Here we go. All right, so we got temperature, we got humidity. Now, Chase, let's talk about feeding. Sure. How often um, and how much of the fruit flies and the different types of fruit flies do you like to, do you like to uh, cover in there? Well, of course, it's always going to depend upon the size of the fruit flies. It's going to depend on the size of the frog, how many frogs you have. But the biggest thing about it is you want to make sure that when you're feeding them that first day, you go back, look the second day, and there's still going to be a few flies left. 
and then the next day it's okay if there's no flies but because you're going to be restoring their food source. Um, now dart frogs do hunt all the time except when they sleep at night and so all you're doing is essentially replenishing their hunting stock. It's not like an animal that you're going to be putting food in a bowl and that's going to come up and eat it and then you feed it. Again, it's going to be something that you're literally just putting that hunting stock in there and that's what the dart frogs do all day as they just hunt down all those flies. Um, so typically for uh, leucomelis this size, we're going to put about maybe a, um, a nickel size amount of Hydei fruit flies. You can also use melagaster, you're just going to use about twice as many melagaster. Okay, so I put a beautiful jewel, jewel orchid right here. That's Lucia discolor. This Lucia discolor, and I got a three pack of Brahms right here. Mm -hmm. That's a Neo Tigrina. Yep. Next, we have, we have a whole lot of fun stuff that we have right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of options available to us. Um, I'm personally thinking that we want something kind of bigger and bushier. I'm thinking this, right there in the middle. I think that'll look good. Calathea pinstripe. I love those. Yep. This soil is wet. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to take, take this bad boy and I'm going to get her buried right there. Now the whole point of this is for it to continue to grow and fill in this open space here. And then of course again we have this crazy creeping fig that we have to figure out where all of these stalks and shoots are going to go without it, you know, completely decimating and taking over. In fact, we might even have the ability to prune it. Mm -hmm. So, oh, just kidding. I love these, but there's a better <laughs> spot. Okay, and those can actually grow in the ground since they're already established with the root system as well. Yeah, and I, I said that in one of my, the last video guys I uploaded with the uh, terraflora. Yeah, you can literally put them right in the ground and they'll take over there we go doesn't overshadow very cool okay so this is what we got so far we still got some really nice ground cover plants but I still see a small void right here I see a void here here well the water bowl we're gonna need a spot for the, uh, I'm gonna need a spot for like the water dish, which I might not use this. I'm probably gonna go with like some nut pods and that's what I'm gonna do. So I have this big Buddha nut pod. I'm actually gonna put this right like this. Leave that nice and then that gives them just another place to hide. They're gonna love that. And the really interesting thing is the more hides that you give them, generally the more bold the frog's going to be because they feel more safe. Do you think this is going to be too busy? I think that looks good. And you should get some really good blush out of those being that close to the light as well. Yep. So they'll be even brighter red. Okay. And then we have some really, uh, we have some other beautiful, uh, look at this. So. All right, Chase, I'm going to have you do the honors of putting these plants in there because they are beautiful. Okay. Um, well, we have a Margravia sententiae. Uh, these are um, very sought after because they have this beautiful red and orange coloration, their growth. Um, this is just going to be on the new growth. It's going to change to green eventually, but as long as you have a new shoot coming off this, you'll always have that beautiful coloration. Um, and I typically like to put these where they're going to be climbing up the structure. Uh, do you, want, you do want to make sure that the roots stay moist, especially while they're establishing. Uh, this rectiflora was already established with the beautiful root system, so it was ready to go. You can just put that anywhere. These, you just want to make sure that you keep the roots moist until they're fully rooted. in. That looks awesome. And with the mushrooms right there, oh, I love mm -hmm. it. Absolutely love it. So then I have a monkey pod, and this is what I'm going to be using as a, uh, as a water bowl for them because the monkey pods hold water. Mm -hmm. Put it right like that into the front, which makes it really easy for you as a keeper to maintain. And then we also have, I also have a bell pod here that holds water, and I'm also going to put the bell pod right there, right like that. Okay. And we also have a bunch of moss here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a tropical liverwort in there as well. I hope I didn't break your container. I'm sorry if no, I did. No, you're fine. This is the tropical? <laughs> yeah, this is tropical liverwort, yep. and then we have some uh, tropical moss as well. Okay. So I'm going to put this 
So I want it to be on the pumice mm -hmm. because the pumice is going to be wet all the time. Yeah, it'll eventually and, overtake the pumice. And then it'll completely overtake the pumice rock. Mm -hmm. At least that's, that's, that's the hope. Yeah, generally liverwort, as long as it's kept moist, still keep growing. And then I'm going to put this right here. What do you think about that, Chase? I think that looks good. Okay. Okay. So next, next I was going to, I got to start figuring out this creeping fig. So while I figure out this creeping fig, Chase, will you just give us a little bit about their feeding with the different sure. types of supplements available, how often, and all that stuff? Sure. Um, so one of the biggest things about dart frogs is in nature they're going to be gathering a lot of different nutrients through the foods that they eat. That's going to be through the varieties of insects. That's also going to be through the gut content of those insects, which is going to be the native plants. Those insects are going to be eating the plants, and then that content from the guts of the insects, the vitamins, the minerals, that's going to be transferred to the frogs through their diet. They're also going to be absorbing some of the minerals dermally as well, like any puddles that they jump through, the water, any of the clays that they're on. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons I came up with the clay bath was because I wanted something that the frogs could absorb calcium, magnesium, iron, cobalt, all those super, viable, uh, super vital minerals through their skin like they do in nature. Um, so what we try to do is we try to replicate that diet in captivity. Uh, as you know, we're going to be given a bland diet of fruit flies. Those fruit flies uh, have the proteins, they have the fats, uh, but they're not going to have um, the minerals and the vitamins that those uh, dart frogs are going to need. Uh, particularly, vitamins are very sensitive to calcium deficiencies and very sensitive to D3 and uh, vitamin A deficiencies as well. And as you know, you need vitamin A and D3 to be able to sequester calcium into their bones. Um, so what we have here is we have some uh, different types of uh, vitamin supplements. Um, you're going to be feeding your frogs every other day. Uh, and then with every feeding, you're going to be using different vitamins. Um, now, we actually have a supplement schedule that you can look up. But typically what we do is we're going to be feeding the Nectin uh, Rep Calcium Plus D3 uh, on day one. And then the next feeding, we'll do usually like a Repashi Calcium Plus. And then we'll typically do the Nectin Multi Rep and then the Repashi Supervite. Um, now that's for froglets up to adult frogs, but if you have Ufagas, which typically have a higher vitamin A requirement, or if you have breeding frogs, which they typically use a lot of vitamin A in egg production, uh, then you can also add in uh, vitamin A into their diet once a month. Now you have Repashi vitamin A, and then we also have Nectin Rep, which Nectin, Nectin Rep is a little bit more potent than what the Repashi is. Um, I typically like to use the Nectin uh, myself, but we also use Repashi every now and then. Um, Rapashi is one of the most trusted brands in America. Nectin is the most trusted brand in Europe. Yep. And the beautiful thing about it is we have two of the highest quality vitamins here. Um, so with that extra vitamin A, if you have any uh, fertility issues, typically that extra vitamin A is going to solve those fertility issues with your frogs. Um, also getting these vitamins to them, you're going to make sure that you don't run into neurological issues. Uh, in the past, people that um, had expired vitamins, you want to be changing them out every about three to six months at the maximum because those vitamins do oxidize as soon as they're exposed to air. In the past, people that weren't supplementing properly or they weren't supplementing at all, uh, the frogs sometimes have seizures all of a sudden yep. or they would have metabolic bone disease, they would have short legs, they have a short spine, they would have a sticky tongue syndrome where they would flick at the flies but they yep. wouldn't be able, able to, to actually them. get the flies. Yep. Um, so it's so, so, so important to give them the proper uh, vitamins and minerals. Uh, the nice thing about the frogs though is that you don't need a UV light on it. Uh, a lot of animals need UV light, like beer dragons for instance, for D3 production, but we actually provide them their diet, so it's not needed for the dart frogs. So that was amazing. So I got a bunch of stuff that I put in here I want to show you. So I put the, we're gonna, so my, my hope is that with the, the Selaginella is gonna cover all of down here. The Rectiflora is gonna grow up here in conjunction with the Stencinii. Put another Margravia right here. I really trimmed back the, uh, the creeping fig right here in hopes that it's mainly gonna concentrate down around here, like so. As you can see, I got the, 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 the Ricialis. Oh, the Riffifora uh, dragon Riffifora tail. Riffifora dragon tail, I got mm -hmm. that added right in here in hopes it's gonna kinda go over. And then of course we put a little bit of creeping fig up there on the top. So we love the fig, I really hope it really covers everything and really just makes everything pop. Um, so the hope is that all of this is gonna continue to, uh, is gonna continue to, you know, to grow and stay healthy and prosper and stuff like that. 
Okay, so as far as misting is concerned, we're going to be misting this tank multiple times a day. So this tank is going to be hooked up to a Mist King starter system. Highly recommend Mist King. It's, it's honestly, there's nothing better. Uh, so we're going to have a single nozzle that's going to come out right here. And it's going to be pointing out this way to make sure that the mist is going to cover everything. Okay, And for the Lucamellas, uh, we're going to have them be in there. Uh, to have this go off about three times a day for about 15 seconds and that should really that should really do the trick with the water level knowing ever never ever going past the drainage layer uh, so with that being said uh, I think what this tank needs is a really good misting and then maybe we can introduce the frogs sounds good okay next it needs the, good. The, the, the Halloween <laughs> decor Chase, I want you to do this part okay. because you should be very proud. <laughs> Feel free to use whatever you want. Okay. okay. All right. That so works. we got the last part of the build. We got the moss in here. We got not the best for last because putting the frogs in is best for last. But Chase <laughs> also 3D prints a bunch of really cool stuff. I do. Um, and all this is vivarium safe. Um, it's actually inert um, once it's fully cured. And so these, um, these are actually anatomically correct as well. I have a lot of anatomically correct dinosaur skulls. Um, like you see this uh, mosasaur here. And I also have uh, anatomically correct uh, human skulls as well, which you can see that little tiny skull there. So it's proportional to the frogs more or less if you had giant frogs. So Pretty I'm going to cool. put some of these little guys in just so that we have a little bit of a Halloween decor. Because it is almost Halloween. It is. And we also have some little gravestones as well. It's where we can do like a little, uh, little graveyard in there too for the Halloween spirit. Like a little hidden Don't mind me. graveyard in there. I'm just missing the crap out of this enclosure. Oh, you're good. Spray you. <laughs> okay, cool. And then we're going to put in uh, a couple little pumpkins. We got some little... Halloween pumpkins that we can put in. Put one oh, in those there. tombstones are freaking awesome, dude! Aren't those neat? It's like a little. It's like a little. Uh, yeah. Put in, you know, a little skull there. We put a little skull there. There we go. It's almost like you know, Island of Kong. You have these giant frogs, these man-eating frogs. I love the mushrooms. The mushrooms <laughs> are so cool. And so, guys, again, overview while he's doing this, we have Hydro Grow version 2 on the bottom, screen divider, Terraflora mixed with triple A's with sphagnum moss, leaf litter, fungal and bacterial inoculants with, with, temp with uh, tropical springtails, dwarf white isopods, with a bunch of different types of plants, a universal rock background, a 22-inch BioDude Glow and Grow LED on the top, as usual, with my LED props. And we will be maintaining and watching the temperature in here to make sure to maintain we're doing it correctly with my thermometer hygrometer. Okay. For the wood, we use some Malaysian driftwood, some ghost wood, as well as tiny 3D printed glow in the dark mushrooms that will soon be available, but are currently on the biodude.com, but will be are available on Chase's website, houstonfrogs.com, which you can see all his products that we used in here are listed in the, in the, in the description, guys. So make sure you check out his website too. Um, but I love how this turned out, man. I love it. I, think, I do I too. I think it looks freaking great. Oh, and all these little like tiny accents in here just <laughs> really, really take it in. All right, Chase, anything else that you want to do for this enclosure before we put in the inhabitants? I think that should be good. Okay. I think they'll feel right at home. I do. I want to put some water in there. There we go. So obviously, we're not intending, like, they probably will breed regardless, but we don't have a cocoa hut in here. We don't have, you know, a petri dish egg laying site or whatever type of egg laying site you want to provide. This was built to give them lots of places to climb. Lots of places to hide, mm -hmm. with especially Lucamellas being loving to call, being pretty loud. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of those things that um, it's nice to watch the males get to the top of the cage and call their little hearts out. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think I think it's time to to introduce the frogs. What do you think? I think we should do it. All right, Chase. Do you want to do the honors? I'm sure. You, you are the guest here. Let's. <laughs> so, 
these beautiful fine spot leucamellas. All right, little guys. There you go. This female is very chunky. She is a unit, dude, with a capital go U. Go ahead. Yeah, I try to touch them as little as possible since they do absorb things through their skin. My hands are clean, but sometimes they need a little bit of a nudge. There you go, girl. There you go. Nice. And there you go. Go ahead. Go after your lady. Nice. Dude, look how big they are. They're <laughs> so beautiful. Wow. We keep them. I'm All blown nice away. I'm blown away. <laughs> I love how this tank turned out. The frogs, their Pittsburgh Steelers cover uh, colors, go Steelers. Absolutely. Um, and I just love the little, the, the, the minor Halloween theme with all the prehistoric dinosaur bones with the land of the giant frogs. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this build. I really hope you guys took something from this build for your frogs at home. And you guys know me. I'm jo my name's Josh. I am the owner and founder of The Bio Dude. You can visit my website, thebiodude.com. Subscribe. Like me on Facebook, Instagram, all that jazz. And I'm Chase Jings with Houston Frogs, and uh, you can find our materials at HoustonFrogs.com. I really appreciate everybody's support. The dude abides. <laughs>